Uh, good morning everybody. Uh, we started the day about 35 minutes late. Uh, let's see how best we can cover up uh, some of the time so that uh, the closing time should remain at 4.30 so that there is no trouble for people who are taking the evening flights from Hyderabad. So <coughs> today we have a little lengthy session. So we would uh, so this topic is on uh, resistance, resurgence, and uh, residue management with biopesticides. That's, I think, uh, most apt. But uh, all, all the top subtopics divided were not on any of this on highlight. So I would like to dwell on this. Uh, all the biopests are very good into this particular aspect uh, of resistance management and residue management as well as uh, resurgence. So, <clears throat> it is a general uh, uh, nomenclature what we use nowadays onto these uh, areas. <clears throat> so, I request the speakers to cover at least uh, half a minute or one minute onto this key topic because this is something which we missed out in writing uh, independently to everybody. So, this will be part of uh, all of your uh, uh, <clears throat> presentations also. So, without taking much time, I would like to invite the first speaker, John Peter, Dr. John Peter, to come onto the stage and take up his presentation, please. Can I have the first slide? I am John Peter. My, most of you might be knowing about me by this time, uh, Vice President Vipa. Uh, <coughs> so I'm going to talk about the biopesticides, prospects and challenges in production technology. Okay. So <coughs> regarding the prospects, first I will concentrate on the prospects because biopesticides globally is gaining attention because of various other reasons. First, we will focus on why it is getting attention across the globe and what are all the prospects of selling or manufacturing biopesticides in India and elsewhere. So <clears throat> I'll be covering on the prospects, global trends, awaiting opportunities, regulatory updates, and opportunities for MSME. So when it is going for the, when we are talking about the global trends, the critical scrutiny on more toxic pesticides. This is an important factor where biopesticide is gaining slight edge over the pesticides. Pesticide market is already stagnant, the growth is very limited, whereas the biopesticide market right now it is growing at the rate of at least 10 to uh, 12, um, this one uh, GP annually. So this and one more thing is, globally, people are interested in consuming pesticide-free or safe food products. And when it is coming into that category, because, because of the economy, awareness, all these things are happening. And in fact, COVID also has induced a certain compulsion among the consumer that they should consume the uh, quality food, nutrient food as well as the quality food and there is a quantum shift in the perception of the consumer that they should consume only the quality food products across the globe. This is one. And the residue uh, free food is also coming under that category. For example, in Punjab, um, uh, this basmati rice exported is coming back because of the tricyclosol residues. Tea is having the problem, whichever the high value crops are having the problem and uh, when these problems are arising, the best handy solution is the biopesticide and non-arrival of many of the new molecules in the pesticide market because developing a pesticide molecule takes time as well as money 
and energy. And uh, that much of energy is not driven to the pesticide molecule because the, uh, uh, the diversion of attention is happening among the pesticide industry also, why I should invest, and the consumer reluctance in acceptance, all these things are happening. So new molecule arrival is becoming limited. Whereas biopesticide, n number of molecules can be developed. So opportunities are more. Interest shown by global players for clean, bio pesticides, uh, clean pesticides. So this is, I, this also I have covered. Inversive pest. Say for example, we have the thrips. Now, devastating all the, uh, it started with the chili and migrated to different crops and uh, the economical damage to the growing crop is very high because of the invasive pest and it is not being controlled by any of the single molecule of the existing pesticides. When it is not able to be controlled by the pesticide and the biopesticide like Bavaria, Metarhysium and Verticillium are uh, becoming a handy and alternative to the um, pesticide whereas some kind of synergy is happening farmer is using one round of pesticide two rounds of biopesticides something similar to that and resurgence is another issue where continuous use of same molecule resurgence is coming and uh, biopesticide alternates uh, and reduces this resurgence effect biological success and complements chemicals this is what I was talking about uh, and uh, there is a possibility of integration of these biologicals very effectively with the chemical existing chemical pesticides and uh, if the uh, grower is not organic oriented. So awaiting opportunities, seed priming is one of the biggest awaiting opportunities I am foreseeing. Why? Because the seed is right now in India is coated with theorem. Theorem is a cancer causing, it is proved, already it is proved, cancer causing fungicide and uh, <clears throat> when it is coated with the seed, it is protecting little bit and imidacloprid also is being um, taken care, but the biological seed priming, seed is coated with the biologicals multi functioning biological when it is coated, it is giving immense benefit to the um, seed germination, virulence uh, of the seedling and the growth and efficacy of the plant. So this is the prime area where the biological can make a dent as well as make a very good impact on uh, the seed industry. Ban and forate, carbofuran and chloropyrifos. So, these three molecules and the people extensively used in India. And uh, chloropyrifos is not banned, but whereas forate and carbofuran has, have been banned. And uh, when it is banned earlier, um, people used to control the insect pests as well as to an extent as a residual effect, the nematode control was also happened because of uh, root knot nematode uh, also happened because of this carbofuran and forate. Whereas now, because of the withdrawal, everywhere the nematode problem is arising. We have better solutions like Paslomyces, Trichoderma harzianum, and uh, also Bacillus species. We are also developing uh, one Bacillus species that is able to control the nematode as well as the um, fungal pathogens. So multiple action biopesticides are available that can take care of the removal of these molecules. And uh, chloropyrifos especially, now European countries have banned chloropyrifos including Australia. And uh, when they have banned the turf grass maintenance has become a very big problem to the European countries. And the uh, termite problem and the root grub problem, all these problems are emerging as a big challenge. And metarhysium is the alternative molecule people are looking for and the market is growing uh, across the, the European country for the biopesticides because of the withdrawal of chloropyrifos. Biofungicides and bionematicides, this is what I was talking about. Even the uh, the uh, price of the uh, 
biofungis is say for example copper oxychloride extensively we used to use copper oxychloride and for the management of several uh, fungal problems now copper oxychloride price is very high when compared to two or three years before so farmers started looking for alternative and they are the trichoderma is becoming very handy and uh, they started using trichoderma extensively trichoderma in this country has given a very good dent for copper oxychloride carbon disum and mango sap these three molecules are being uh, replaced or partially replaced by the trichoderma um, across the country thanks to tamil nadu agriculture university who have first invented introduced this uh, trichoderma into the country as a biopesticide and uh, <clears throat> horticulture and the high valley crops this also is one of the factor where horticulture crops are this biopesticides are working wonderful in the horticulture crops short duration crops the problem is we put something and expect the greater harvest within 60 days 90 days whereas the long duration crops and horticulture crops this is not happening this biopesticides are um, well received in the high value crop as well as the horticulture crops integration with the chemical pesticides this is one area um, i will talk to you later about this combination with the chemical pesticides this also we will be um, addressing improved formulation technologies earlier it was only the production mixing with the, some carrier and uh, and uh, give it to the farmers now we have devised system to improvise the formulation, packing, forwarding, so improve the shelf life, efficacy, and the deliverables. It's not mine. It's someone else. No, no. Hey, this is stopwatch. Nothing else. No, I am counting. No problem. Okay, right. So um, <coughs> coming back to the combination biopesticides, that also I am going to cover. And uh, regarding the combination biopesticide, unfortunately, Dr. Malhotra is probably absent today. And uh, BIPA, from the BIPA side, we have represented when Dr. Malhotra was the commissioner and he has gracefully agreed for your presentation. I have presented in 425th RC meeting, January 25, 2021. And uh, they have formed a committee, Dr. Rahman, thanks to you, and uh, you know, he was also one of the committee member for formulating the guideline. And uh, um, this committee has recommended the combination pesticide, biopesticide. And though we are little late, because probably seven or eight years, we are uh, below the target. See, already EPA has given a registration of combination biopesticide with Bacillus lichiniformis and Bacillus subtilis strain. And uh, this is done in 2018 to FMC. And Canada and the um, blanket label claim for 25-7 crops and the US, everything, everywhere they have registered. And uh, way forward is since the combination biopesticide has been approved by the country, we have the possibility of bioinsecticide combination, biofungicide combination, bionematicide combination. In fact, EPN with um, uh, Mr. Sudha Reddy is going to talk about EPN. EPN with biofungicides um, or the bioinsecticides, biobactericidal combination, bioinsecticide plus biofungicide combination, biofungicide, bionematicide, bionematicide, bioinsecticide, biopesticide and pheromone combinations, biopesticide and botanical combination. In addition to that, globally, leading com agrochemical companies are working on integrating emamectin with Bt. So um, this China is already pioneered in that and they will come f um, very soon with the combination biopesticide and uh, there is a possibility of combining the chemical with the biologicals. And uh, the guideline, um, uh, there are some constraints. Co <coughs> 9.3 has become 9.4 against the data protection. So this, I will um, cover this later. Challenges, stability of the organism. We are uh, taking care of, uh, I quickly summarize, we are taking care of the um, 
live microbes like corona virus how it has become virulent become uh, one more uh, dose one more dose now it is common cold likewise there is a challenge for keeping the microbe in the virulent stage so that someone yesterday while discussing they have asked why we need so much of r and d and other things definitely we need this r and d to focus on keeping this microbe hare this is your target this is your enemy you have to go on attack for this we need a full fledged uh, support system in terms of r and d stability of the r and d and its genetic variability is one more factor and the carrier carrier especially in india across um, the icr system we have used talcum powder as a carrier and uh, johnson and johnson issue has given some insight that we should divert from the talcum powder and go for alternative and stability of the formulation this is also one area concern i don't have much time i have another one minute moisture content of the formulation because we we propose 8% 12% it should be your formulation should be only this this much but we are also promoting the liquid biopesticide approval is there when liquid biopesticide is sustaining in the liquid formulation why you are promoting this 8% 12% like that the regulation i discussed with dr malhotra also we will be working on that the ph of the formulation is another criteria uh, dr vimala prasad yesterday also mentioned about some other and biopesticides is also there it is not like we declare our product and get it approved because regulation is uh, ph means only this much for your biopesticide so we cannot go beyond unless the government alter this so we will work on that data production is one of the biggest challenge because we spend around half a crore rupee on the production on the on the development of the data and when it becomes uh, me too registration me too registration is very good for the pesticide because we never invent pesticide we copy from multinationals so indian companies are getting benefited because of the me too registration for pesticide but but not for the biopesticide because biopesticide we are developing we are the leaders we need protection and for the government data whatever the government wants to do they can do but not the private isolates private companies isolates that cabrc should be vetted vetted for the data protection that bipa is doing finally the licensing and the environmental parameters this is very limited i am um, through final slide the raw material of the neem neem is also one of the important parameters and off late the availability of the raw material as well as the quality of the seed availability is very very um, Uh, demanding and they are not able to cope up and the diseases caused by the t mosquito bug combined with the fusarium is also one of the problem and the third one is government is promoting um, avenue plantation as um, some other plants earlier we used to Uh, plant only the neem trees and other uh, uh, pongamia and the related trees now government ghmc wherever it is they are promoting other plants not the neem tree so there should be a quantum shift so because south india um, the azaractin content is very very high only we can produce in south india the quality neem seeds that there should be a policy shift in um, the uh, this one thank you very much uh, th uh, thanks lakshmi for permitting me for one more minute and if there are any question we will discuss little later now uh, i'll be talking on bioherbicides can you put the slide on please for so i'm talking on microbial herbicides the emerging opportunities next slide please oh i can handle here don't worry so before going to what is going to be the future i think we need to see 
this slide is very, very important because uh, the trend is going to be totally different for next 40, 50 years, if you see, trend is going to be different for the biopesticides. Now, the global market for the biologicals in 2017 from 2.8 billion, so it has gone to 5.5 to 5.5 billion in 2023. And the major segment of that is bioherbicides as natural actives and microorganisms and BTs, which are generally supposed to be the stable products get more priority into biopesticides. Today, biopesticides are only 5% of the total, total crop production market and ranked around 5.5 billion by 2030. It is expected to be reaching about 11.3 billion. From, from there on, by 2050, it is expected to be equal to synthetic pesticides and then surpass. If you see here, oh. here the, the blue line is the synthetic pesticides, how they are going to behave, and the orange line which is plotted on the graph is going to be the biopesticides. Now, these biopesticides, sorry, Here, you know, like uh, these biopesticides are going to surpass beyond 2063. They are going to lead, they are going to be beyond agrochemical. So, biopesticides have got a great future. We all need to invest into this. And European Union is looking at reduction of 50% use of chemical pesticides by 2030. Thus, Europe is going to be an attractive market for biopesticides in the near future. That's 2030 and it's quite nearby. So, generally what is the scene on the herbicidal scene? We have physical hand weeding and chemical, insects and rust fungi, what has been used so far. Now they have their own inherent problems. Like I mean, if you see physical, there's a lot of health hazards. Then for chemical, we have non-target area contamination is huge. The, uh, the toxic pesticides are coming into the food systems and other things and polluting water also. And the insects which have been released like Zygogramma, Neochetna, Acarne, ladybird beetles and other things, there are practical issues with them. So they need to also have a microenvironment and food availability. And it's non-economical for commercialization because <clears throat> you can't continuously maintain uh, them for taking care of a weed. Like I mean, for instance, water hyacinth in one acre, the mat will be for 1.25, 125 tons in one acre. How many weevils are required for eating that and maintaining them? So this is becoming a big issue for commercialization. So rust fungi again, it needs, it cannot be mass multiplied, so it always requires a host. Commercialization is a problem. So in our technology, what we have done, we can mass multiply, it's commercially viable, eco-friendly, approved in organic agriculture world over, prevents non-target area pollution helps in weed resistance management too. This is very interesting. This bioherbicide where we are doing on the metabolite base or the biochemical base, it is on a PPM level. And the chemical weed side, it is working much better than the chemical weed sites on the binding strength in bioinformatics when we study that. So this is a, there is a possibility of extending the life cycle of some of the good weedicides, chemical weedicides also, and also to break the resistance of the weeds. So there are some surprises in weedicide market. With the introduction of Roundup Ready transgenic crops, 
world chemical industry started increasing production of glyphosate manifold. Then came the regulatory issues with glyphosate as a carcinogen and deregistering it or restricting the use. This is leaving a wide gap for the new VD sites as replacement products and biology will be the most ideal thing to look into it. So needs and opportunities for alternative. There is strong need for any new weed management technology because the rapid evolution of the spread of herbicide resistance is very high. Due to the widespread adoption of the transgenic glyphosate resistant GR crops, glyphosate has been overused resulting in evolution of extremely problematic GR weeds. New herbicides with new modes of action are badly needed to combat weeds as well as weeds with resistance. Many natural phytotoxins that might be considered biochemical bioherbicides have a novel mode of actions that might fill this need. There are three mycoherbicides developed by a company AG Bio to control weeds like Parthenium, Lantana and Water Hyacinth. So what we thought is we, we started thinking beyond microbe because of various things like I mean when you living microbe it has to have the suitable microenvironment for it to sustain and perform. And also biopesticides, most of the time farmer feels ease of application is not there or you need to wait for a long time, slow action, all that can be answered by adapting to uh, working on the bioherbicides in this particular way. So we work with the biochemicals of uh, the microbes as microbial illots. So AG Bio microbial herbicide is based on CFCF, that's cell-free culture filtrate containing biochemical crude metabolites as mycoherbicides. We have already done the separation and characterization studies. Novel biochemical molecules are identified, very specific to the host weed, it is not work, uh, affecting the same family also. So these are some of the advantages from scientific point of view. Stable and performs fast as, a good, as good as a chemical we decide. We can see within two hours the action is initiated. As good as any other chemical we decide. Eco-friendly and helps in weed resistance management. These are the three weeds I was telling you what we have done. So this is the distribution, if you see, the distribution of these uh, weeds, the first one is uh, water hyacinth is in more than about 50, it's originating from South American countries. Similarly, water hyacinth is in the middle, it's occupied more than 50 countries already and it is a major pest. Uh, we got this into India with PL480 uh, way back in 1950s. And Lantana is also originating from the South American countries and they're all invasive uh, weeds which have come to our country and many other countries too. So this is, uh, I'm just sh showing you how good the effectiveness is. So this is normally we can, as you spray any other chemical we uh, decide, you can spray with uh, high volume uh, sprayers or low volume sprayers, ultra low volume sprayers. We can use uh, all kinds of things depending on the situation of uh, the weed uh, infestation and other things. So this is how we spray. It is uh, say something like about 10 to 12 ml per liter of a formulation. So it is a little higher because uh, we are working at PPM levels. So the dosage needs to be a little higher level. We are not giving any purified uh, metabolites in this. So you can see here on the left corner, Within two hours, curling of the leaf, like a very thick leaf, I mean, uh, water has seen, I mean, Iconia leaf is waxy and very thick. Even that you can see, within two hours, the product applied, you can see the curling. And you can see, in the third day, we give a second repeat spray because in places we, we, we lose some of the areas and while spraying, we miss the area here. If you see here, it's slightly greenish. So we, to cover that, we also gave on the third day a second spray. Then 
fifth day and by about seven to ten days, you can see the last one, how good it has been controlled. So ultimately what happens is, when you apply this, there are two distinct advantages what happened. Evapotranspiration loss of per plant was, say, something like about four to five liters of water every day. So in an acre, we estimated at 125 tons, it will be about 1,25,000 plants. So nearly about four to five lakh liters every day, evapotranspiration is taking place. So now all of us work on carbon footprint. We should now think of water footprint also because this water can be saved for some other purpose. So this is what is my idea. So we are reducing the evapotranspiration loss by using this kind of products. And we also have reduction on the biomass. When we apply, the plant biomass is decreased by 85%. So removal from a lake bed and other things is easy for that because we will be spending for only 15% of the mass. So this, this can be dried and given to crop manuring. Within 14 days you get a very good manure out of it. So this is for uh, parthenium. In 48 hours we can see the results and 7 days it is totally dry. And this is done in a uh, combined weed situation. So it is very specific to Parthenium. It doesn't affect chrysanthemum of the same uh, Asteraceae family. So this is for Lantana. Similarly, by seventh day, we can control the Lantana. This is a very interesting story. We, we have a deer park in the outskirts of Hyderabad. Uh, the population has grown very much, the deer population them, but there are no grasses. It is all occupied with this uh, lantana like this, Parthenium and lantana. So literally they take grass and feed the deers every day in different points. This is about 385 hectares. There's a huge place. We went there and the forest department wanted not to disturb any other plant, we want to control only this. In such a sensitive areas of application, these are very, very useful for us. So we have done the NMR studies. So we identified the molecule and we, we know the structure of the molecule, everything. So technology status is we have protected totally. A bioefficacy is done and bioinformatics study is also completed. So this is the bioefficacy studies. NRCWS, Jabalpur has done the studies for three locations, one season trial is over. So we are 93B ready now. So th this is what I'm just sharing this. Uh, we have the bioinformatics studies and it is binding very well in uh, three groups, like I mean group 11, for carotenoid, uh, it inhibits carotenoid in the group 11, uh, oxidase inhibitor in group 14. So this is the ligands which are binding so well with the standard. The standard what we have compared is existing chemical VD sites. So that is much better than, uh, the R product is much better in binding strength and other things. So. It's doing very well. I mean, in fact, actually, we compared this compound with almost about 20 chemical uh, herbicides. So this is uh, at par or better in, I mean, this excellent in these three uh, areas, but at par with all the other chemicals. So the chemical industry is also showing keen interest to look at such products, maybe to sustain for their own marketing, I mean, see, if their sale value of one product is coming down, as for my first slide, they would like to establish and use the same network to refill it with our biopesticides for tomorrow. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, Lakshmi. Uh, thank you, Bipa. Thank you, the industry. 
I think everybody has today come here to understand what else we can deliver to the world in the area of biopesticides. So I bring to your attention a new class of molecules which has to play with the mind game of insects, insect behavioral modification. How can we do that? It, we can do insect behavioral modification by semi-chemicals. Semi-chemicals are basically compounds which are emitted by flowers, plants, insects. So they fall under various category. They fall under sex pheromones, basically which are released by female insects, plant volatiles, which are basically attractants, aggregation pheromone where male and female aggregate to mate and colonize, anti-aggregation pheromone. These are the class of molecules which basically communicate not to aggregate. So how can we use these four group of semi-chemicals to modify insect behavior and help in crop protection? So on these lines, on these lines, I would like to bring to your attention what, we, what India has developed and where we are heading to. I think Lakshmi has been mentioning about $10 billion industry, biopesticide industry. And Bipa has asked me to you know, showcase how we can capture $2 billion of the $10 billion from India. And uh, how we can deliver, I think I will uh, debrief you. Next slide, please. So this is our discovery center. So it was former DuPont Center where we are based out of it. We have a multidisciplinary team from molecular biology, formulations, physical chemistry, chemical ecology. And I should say we are very proud that this is only chemical ecology lab in India. And when, with the domain expertise, we are the only in, one in the world to have completely vertically integrated, backward integrated company in chemical ecology. And I thank my mentors, Professor Rajura Reddy, who is heading our research and development division. And thanks to BIPA, and they're all stakeholders, many of them, and they're trying to push the technology towards advancements. Next slide, please. In India, we are going to bring in 14 new molecules. I think John, Dr. John Peter was mentioning, there will be no new molecules in ag industry in near future and insect resistance is a big issue. So how India can resist in nine threes? Where innovations can come, in which area? So I would like to bring in your attention that we are the company who bought almost like about 40 molecules in schedules in CIB, and we are the first company to register a mating deception product, new molecule registration in India. And the first one, what we approved is already in the market today. It's for management of uh, pink bollworm in cotton, which is a big menace. And what we are trying to address is of crops for pest for unmet needs, where we do not have a conventional solutions. So be it uh, sugarcane, be it falami worm, be it fruit flies, be it uh, rice yellow stem borers, where the larva live inside the plant, there are no solutions. So this is a technology where it's an insect population control tool using sex pheromones. I think I will explain the concept in the next slide. This is how we want to change the behavioral pattern of insects. So it's a mating deception technology. What it means is we apply, we create artificial point sources, female point sources which emit synthetic sex pheromone of a female insect. And if you see in the axle of the leaf, so you have a chickpea kind of a formulation which works in the field for three months and where all the males will be hovering around and thinking it a female. Hence, the male will never be able to mate with the female partner. So that's, a, that's all about it. And what we have showcased is more than one lakh acres. We have showcased the technology, how it works. It's a complete trap shutdown. What it means is you will not see any population in the field. That's, a, that's how beautifully the technology works. Now, what are the limitations for this technology? Globally, 40 years, this technology is highly sustainable. There's no insect resistance, because if it, in, there's any resistance for pheromone, the species will end, because there will be no natural communication between the insects, and they will never be able to reproduce further. So no insect resistance, sustainability. It's a natural compound which is emitted by, by, by female insects. 
So it's all a, it's all a natural product. And this is where the technology, what we advance is the amount of pheromone what we use in the formulation. So today the technology globally, it's only available for three to four products and they use about 100 to 150 grams of pheromone. So what advances we bought is today, the product which we launched uses only 30 grams of pheromone for six months. And going forward, next slide please. So this is a product which we say a no pump, no spray technology, which we launched, uh, this is the first year of our launch. We have been selling in the market for almost uh, one lakh acres this year. Next slide. This is a f another solution for fruit flies. It's an attract and kill technology. First time in the world which has a male attractant as well as a female oviposition pheromones. So we mix a, just hardly one gram of uh, synthetic insecticide in this formulation and we can apply a dollops, 250 dollops in field and you will see complete decline of the population. We were able to showcase 98% control in fruit flies using these two products. Next slide, please. So this is one of the, so where do we address? Where is India heading to? So we have developed more than 75 synthetic pheromones and out of which more than 30 have been serviced for US federal programs. So one spe very, very specific program I would like to emphasize is the Slow This Pet program. The Slow This Pet program has been in implementation for last five years where we are supporting the USDA in supply of the sex pheromone from India, manufactured in India. So where it is formulated over there and then they spread more than two lakh acres. So the Gypsy Moth program, the Slow This Pet program, which basically from Canada, they pupa hatch and they migrate into the US. And they create a lot of havoc in for, uh, for human health in terms of uh, causing allergies. So this is, a this is a technology where we should use drones to implement in India and to slow the spread of devastated pests like falami worm, ping bollworm, and many other things. Next slide, please. So these are the advanced technologies. So as I said, why is the technology so expensive? $150, 100 to $150, and why industry is using 150 grams? And these are the technologies which can reduce the amount of pheromone because of the sensitivity. The sensitivity is so high, even if you touch the tube, you will see a attraction of uh, male moths in the field. So that is a kind of sensitivity. And if you see, look at the various uh, nanotechnologies which we have developed. So we have two delivery systems, tablets, the paste, which I explained you earlier, a sprayable microcapsules, and a lipid. The lipid is very unique in its, uh, in its innovation. So what it creates is it makes a film on the leaf surface. So it can retain the nanomaterials, nanoparticles, which releases the pheromone for more than 30 days onto the leaf surface, and it's highly rain fast. So that is the key technologies which we brought into, uh, into the, uh, there are almost like nine patents on various technologies, which we integrate to bring in three different products. Next slide, please. So these are the, three platforms which we developed for mating disruption. So Kermit P is a paste, Kermit T is a tablet. This is the first tablet in the world which works underwater. So you can throw the tablet inside the water, the moths can dive inside the water. That's the uniqueness of this particular technology. And we have Kermit SM, a sprayable version of the same. And in the future, to support the industry, what we are going to launch is the sprayable mixtures wherein in the form of ferro shots, we can mix the pheromone insecticide where the industry can use, reduce the load, the insecticide load in the crop. Next slide, please. So this is where, where we are heading. So just to give you an um, overall outlook, where the world is, where India stands. So if you look at where India stands, today we are already scaled up more than 45 plus products in in pheromones, whereas the entire world put together, you hardly see about 10 to 15 collectively. Oh, no. And we are the company which also produce pheromones through biological production. So we are the company which have mapped from genomes to pheromone. So we are the first company who have been working on developing 
species specific pheromones through biological synthesis so that's our very unique platform we use our molecular biology expertise to identify insect pathway genes and clone them in microbial systems and plant systems to produce pheromones so next 5 years down the line you will see some seeds which can release pheromone naturally in the environment that's a technology which we are going to bring in and we are as of now we have cracked five of them whereas the world has cracked only two so we are the company again we have various delivery systems not one we have the sprayables we have the tablets we have the paste we have several delivery platforms and today we are able to partner with more than nine companies globally who would like to collaborate with us take the technology forward to penetrate the market yeah thank you so thank you everyone so is a it's okay should just yeah so is it audible in the last yes so everyone has mobile in the hands right so can you guys type cancer train in the mobile cancer train cancer 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 train c a n c e r t r a i n so a train popularly goes every day from punjab to rajasthan for the treatment of a cancer where majority of people are farmers who go for treatment of this cancer so it's not just the punjab or rajasthan it's a story of every state every uh, village where farmers are going through this cancer because they have access to this chemical and they inhale and they do it i have a small video to show uh, how the present spray happens can you please uh, uh, play the first video so i'm showing a, a crop chili crop which is organic spray in a 120 days they do 10 sprays so you can see how the spray happens at present in the reality today so this is a spray uh, 10 days back which we went and we took the video where you can see the, the spray how it happens okay. you can play the second video so you can see just i wanted to show a small glance the technology which we built how is different from the normal spray to this don't base spray so you could see the same crop we were doing the spray with the drones where it's just falls on the crop and where farmer was spraying 100 liters per acre it just sprays 10 liters per acre and he was doing for 3 4 hours acre it does in 8 minutes a acre that's the difference what we the technology which we are talking okay okay just you can keep the presentation just i wanted to give you a little understanding in the start so that you understand what i'm speaking um, overall so like every farmer has seen only one uh, machine which has helped him a lot is a tractor like in last 15 20 years the only machinery which we could see which is helpful for a farmer so like it does spraying carrying and does the plowing multiple activities right similarly uh, we started our journey with uh, agriculture in the spraying activity which every farmer wants it because of lack of labor force or because of health hazard and the time sense then we started working in the other applications because we were firmly uh, believe that if uh, we are giving something in agriculture that to uh, which wanted to cater to a farmers it has to be multi utility it can't be a one application where they just use for a couple of days or months in a year that's where we uh, started working so we were started working closely with the agriculture university here pjtsu so in back 2018 when uh, we were asking people like we'll do the spraying and everything so everybody were used to ask us like a, a farmer sprays 100 liters you are saying 8 to 10 liters 
do you have any data, any scientific proofs and everything? So then we started working with uh, uh, Dr. Praveen Raogaru, VC, former VC of PGTSU. So we started working on five different activities. So, uh, and we have taken a five, uh, like seven different crops, like cotton in Warangal, rice in Rajendranagar and the Nalgunda, red gram in uh, uh, Tandoor, like different locations and we started working from 2018 to 2020. So for two crop cycles we did. So are at different heights and different nozzles on and we started studying the impact on flora fauna, impact on the water bodies and on the soil and in 2020 when ICR came for a visit and they saw this data, they started understanding that led to what you see today, everybody talks about drones, right? The, the initiation happened because of we had a immediate scientific data with us where ICR and CIB board uh, able to see and the ministry started uh, giving subsidy now like like a tractor you buy for agriculture now you can buy your drone at 100 percent subsidy with kvks or 75 percent subsidy with fpos if it is an individual his aggregate 60 percent that's very encouraging for this space so uh, in last three years from a space where everybody nobody used to uh, like see a drone is useful or they used to see like you're carrying something AK-47 in public domain to a uh, place where today everybody thinks it's a very good equipment, it's for a purpose, it's useful for a purpose. That's a shift we could see. The biggest reason is COVID might have impacted every sector but actually it has helped really to the drone sector a lot is because the policies or regulation which were taking for 10 years, 15 years in less than one year, there are a lot of regulations and the policy has smoothened up and in between there was locust attack. That led to a little more speeding up the, uh, the entire policies. So now today, uh, the, in India, the next em big employment which is going to create the sector is, is the drone sector. So I'll just take you what we were doing it. So, like uh, we popularly see, everybody talks, right, like a farmer has to, uh, we have to in double the income of a farmer and we have to increase his, like a more of a, his productivity or, so uh, then we also started uh, seeing the all the traditional practices. All the traditional practices consume the money on inputs, machinery and people Ultimately, he is not able to recover the cost what he is spending and he is not able to make the profits. So, then uh, we started understanding what exactly the problems. Uh, then we started talking to the farmers or people who are working in the agriculture, it can be a advisories or people who are working like a pesticide, seed companies. Then we did not see any data which is quantifiable, which is actually, so no, there is no data of a pest, major pest, major diseases, and there is no farm level data. So, and there are few, uh, uh, all the predictions were happening with the satellite based data, which are a week or 10 days kind of a delay, by then the pest or disease might have spread out. So that's where we started addressing this, all the problem statements. Ultimately, we wanted to uh, see this spray what was they were doing like ultimately the healthy people like you and I were getting affected <laughs> with the because same thing we inhale like uh, the incident of Evatmal if you might be knowing it because they were spraying and entire wind blew lot of people got affected so similar it's happening then actually we started talking to the farmers then we understood a farmer never uses a technology he thinks Anything technology is for his son and is for his grandson who is in US or is in some city, urban city. But actually, only thing he does is goes to a neighbor, he asks what did he do and just does the same thing. And if somebody says that something worked out, then immediately changes chemical and just adopts it. And then if something like scientist kind of a people who are in cities, who are in universities, Fantastic research, fantastic amount of the, the amount of knowledge they have, 
but they are not able to give to a, this transfer of technology or transfer of their advisory to the end farmers. There's a huge gap what we saw. Then ultimately what it does is, whether pest is there or disease is there, he just jumps, carries his neck sprayer and does the activities like spraying. Only these three things which we were able to see. So that's where we started working. Uh, the too simple I'll tell you is, uh, whenever we get a cough, fever, what we do? We don't go to a RMP doctor like our fathers, grandfathers said, right? We go to a doctor, he does a diagnosis and tells where exactly is the problem, he gives a specific medicine and more of an intervention to it, right? Similarly, what we're doing it with the drones, we are trying to scan and do the monitoring because whatever the sensors which you wear there in a CT scan, MRI scan, similar sensors are easy to mount to a drone and we could able to tell where exactly the pest in the crop. Because today, if a farmer has a 20 acres, he is spraying entire 20 acres, knowingly, unknowingly. Ultimately, the cost or time or everything is going on. So, with this, the diagnosis, what we do, it might only the small, small packets in 20 acres, it might be cumulative like four acres, five hours. So, ultimately, the cost on the inputs or the time it takes will reduce drastically. So, it will also take little year or two where we go for localized kind of a spray. Like we flew a drone and already there are a lot of database of a pest or disease and immediately tells where exactly the, the uh, pest or disease and we just treat the localized kind of uh, for the intervention. So that's where we started working a uh, few of application. So then uh, first we solved the problem of spray. Then we saw majority people, uh, the cultivation is a paddy here. And uh, then we saw the, they heavily depend on people. And it is very tough to get the work done. And if we all go to the fields of the paddy, I don't think we'll, we'll run away in half day and we come to the city. I don't think we can work the amount of the hard work it takes. So the first application which we wanted to do was the, they were depending heavily on the people for the transplantation uh, in the paddy, what you see. And over the years, there a lot of uh, innovation happened, like called drum seeding. They, for a drum, at regular intervals, the holes there, they're going to it. And still a person is dependent. And none of the tractors or machinery really work in the more for nursery or the transplantation. So, uh, the, uh, and we saw a lot of snake bites happen very often. That's why we started doing the first automation of activity was the direct seeding, the wet direct seeding. The next, the automation what we observed was the pollination. Like till today, uh, the pollination every day morning and evening they shake the crop the ropes and stick and uh, the in the hybrid rice so we could able to automate the pollination so what we could do in last three years is around seven different applications we could able to automate with a single drone a, like a tractor it's an aerial tractor where you do the different activities and year 365 days every stage a drone intervention can be helpful to a farmer. So being a drone manufacturers, we are trying to enable people to provide the service at a village level to the farmers. Uh, so in last uh, three years, we saw, we worked in eight different locations like Madhya Pradesh, uh, Gujarat, Maharashtra, Andhra, Telangana, Tamil Nadu and Assam. And we could able to work uh, on different, different applications. So this was, and second uh, was the diagnosis element which was saying, right? So we started working with the ICRISAT here because the scientists were outside because of COVID last two years, no, majority of scientists are working from outside the country and the breeders are here. So they do in one acre or two acres, more than 1000 species or 10, like 2000 species. And uh, so there's a popular uh, research, it's called phenotypic research. So we only treat a specific plant and specific kind of uh, the, uh, the infected, not the entire crop. So we could able to create the entire data sets. So now any like a maize, sorghum, PGNP, such like four or five crops, which are African crops, if you take a drone imagery and put in the platform, it's immediately because you have a lot of 
uh, the backend database, the algorithms written, it can able to identify key what sort of a pest, what is the height of the crop, uh, all such kind of a traits because we could able to do it. Uh, in India, it's still corporates are trying to do it. Like a lot of corporates are trying to work, but in I've observed in last three years, in India, a lot of people are still working on research on the ULV formulations. The, their counterpart in US, Israel are working on the technologies like this, plant count or estimation, yield estimation, uh, and this similar kind of activities. So, so this was the research which we were saying that, and the popular, this case study has started from Hyderabad with the university here, uh, and become an example to the entire India now, where drones have become a real time because of the research what would happened here. Uh, second, you might be hearing the popular, this nano urea of uh, IFCO. So we did it in trials in around 13 different states, uh, IFCO trials, and that also one of the important application which we could able to bring uh, to space. This was, I was talking about the, the diagnosis because we could able to tell the biotic, iobiotic, uh, or any nutrient deficiency in, in one acre crop, every plant level we could able to give that like your x-ray kind of a thing and with the color codes so that scientists or the breeders could understand. This was another uh, application which was interesting is because uh, every time you see in news about MSP, right? Like uh, all this data is generally done with a si satellite data. Like, uh, but in the month of September, October, you have a lot of rainfalls, cloudy. So it's very difficult for them to get a real time kind of a satellite data or nearby data. So what we did is with the World Technic Forum and state government here, so we have taken uh, two uh, entire districts uh, in Karim Nagar and we started, uh, we flew the drone, a drone and we could able to identify how much amount of the paddy cotton is yield, yield and we could able to tell the variety of a rice, like a different variety of rice. So pr this prediction itself from, a f they were 60% to we have increased to 89% the accuracy. So uh, in going forward, the better, uh, these accuracies will give a better price to a end farmer in the better MSP format. So, so these are few and today uh, what we do is we provide the hardware and software and the training because like your four-wheeler, you have the, uh, the driving license. There's a pilot license mandatory. So what we do is the end farmer is at two clicks, three clicks, he can run the drone. And can, he, can, he can use the drone. So that simple in five days, he can learn. And can, he can operate and he can start uh, earning. Like example, a drone can do 20 acres minimum per day. If it does 500 rupees per acre also, more than 10,000 rupees he can earn in a day. And if he works for 20 days in a month also, he is able to make 2 lakh rupees. If he recover all his expenses, a lakh, 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 10,000, so more than 90,000 to 1 lakh, he can easily earn with one application like a spraying. So if, that's where we see uh, the recovery of anybody who spends up to 10 lakh rupees is less than 6 months. That's where we could see we could able to create the employment at a rural level. And to give you an example, like a Telangana kind of a state, like you have right to Vedikas around 2500 to 2700. If each around 10 drones is given to each right to Vedikas, more than 25,000 drones are needed in next year or two. That's what, and for each drone, you could employ two to three people. So the next employment or at a rural, which is a, uh, helpful to farmers, is the drone technology. And the real digital transformation and the real uh, technology adoption is happening in 2022 by the farmers is through the drone technology. Thank you. Thank you so much, Prem. I think uh, drones, uh, uh, we see only during the wedding photography now, Prem says, where else can it be used? So that's nice. Um, now, <clears throat> taking, uh, uh, Prem, you need to come back again. Uh, uh, please come back again. Um, I request uh, our advisor, uh, Ram Kondena, sir, to please uh, present the plaque and memento to Prem. <coughs> we 
You should also tell the audience that he met Prime Minister Modi three days back and briefed him about his drone application. We all have seen that photograph in the newspapers. And uh, sir also mentors him. <laughs>
more than 32 years back. He was the first person, so I used to discuss with him how to sell, how you people used to sell. But they've stopped it, but I took it up as a challenging. And farmers or whoever scientists, what is this nonsense you're doing? What is this? Who will buy? All will take a bottles and buy. What is this you're doing? They used to always make a fun of me. And I used to laugh along with them when they make fun. But I used to think in my heart, tomorrow world is this. And today the world is this. And it's amazing. And I felt it's all my spiritual journey more than my business because all these are related towards the nature. If I study each and every product and how it kills, it's amazing it is. And uh, the, the results are much better. But it takes time. It takes time to the farmer. It's not immediately like with the chemicals. The farmers who comes to me and say, ma'am, we lost the crop, just said, just give a chance of using this and come back to me. And they said, ma'am, we got back our money back. Because I was working directly with the farmers and I got a lot of feedback about this product. And the challenging, I, at 10 years I had a challenging. I didn't get even one rupee coin for the first five years. Even one rupee coin, I'm saying it. But still, I took it up as this and now it is doing good and people are buying it in a good price. Now we are selling it to, even to Philippines. I got a big order yesterday evening only, for especially for snail control in paddy. So this is working for grubs, this is working for borers, so many things is working. So people, all industries who are there here, they can look into these products and take it up. Thank you. Uh, good morning to all of you. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, BIPA, and particularly Dr. Reddy, uh, Dr. Uh, Agrawal and uh, Dr. Vankatesh for inviting me and giving me the opportunity to talk uh, in front of all of you uh, this August gathering of the industry and uh, my uh, association with Dr. Reddy is very uh, old like uh, in 2007 uh, when we, I transferred my one of the biopesticide technology to when he was heading Shri Biotech. So that was the first uh, biotechnology, uh, bio uh, biopesticide, which I transferred to Shri Biotech. And that technology was uh, transferred to four Indian companies and one US company to Pamaron. So uh, like yesterday, we were talking about the lacing of the biopesticide with the chemicals. That is the most allegation which the chemical industry gives to the biopesticide. But here I would like to confess that uh, when uh, this bulk biotechnology was uh, tested by the one of the German MNCs uh, for managing the resistance against uh, the insects. And they found that the uh, combination of the ball cure with their chemical pesticides reduced not only manage the resistance, but also reduced the dose. So that's how the combination of the biopesticides, botanicals, and the chemicals can come together. So there's a lot of scope for working together. This is just to tell that uh, this, uh, this allegation is not good. I think we, both the technology should work hand in hand. But today I'm not going to talk about the bulk cure, but I'm going to talk about the microbial metabolites. So first slide, please. Next, please. Uh, so I think uh, this, there is no need to highlight the importance of the microbes, uh, microbial biopesticide here. But I just uh, uh, want to highlight, uh, like uh, in terms of the area, I think uh, we have uh, Europe and North America, Asia, and uh, then second is Asia and Latin America, and Middle East and Africa area-wise. But if we talk about the application-wise, the fruits and vegetables, cereals and grains are the highest priority, followed by all seeds and pulses and the rest of the crop. And if we talk about the formulation-wise, dry formulations were the first one which were introduced. Now we are having the liquid formulations. And by source-wise, like microbes were the first one which is introduced. But now we have the biochemical pesticide, biopesticide, and plant incorporate, that is a GM or the which we have. So these are the T types. Next, please. Uh, next slide, please. Huh. So, uh, if we talk about the different organism-wise, it is heavily dominated by the fungal biopesticide, the microbial biopesticide. Second, by the bacteria, and then the viral, and then the other. So, 66% of the biopesticide market is dominated by the fungal biopesticide. Next, please. And we look, uh, the microbial pesticides, uh, if, it is just slightly just to highlight that uh, we have 15,000 naturally occurring insect specific microorganisms, 1,500. 
and 100 out of that 100 have been found to be having the insecticidal properties. But how many we are using currently? Next, please. Next, so only two of this bacteria, after those 1,500 microorganisms, only two are dominating the market. That is Bacillus and the Pseudomonas. Next, please. Uh, and if we talk about the fungal pathogens, only the very few ones which are dominating. And among that also, Trichoderma is dominating the markets. So there's a huge scope, huge, huge, huge scope to develop the microbial pesticide. And uh, also, like this, uh, India is niche to the biodiversity. We, are, we have four biodiversity hotspots. We are geographically diverse. We have so many niche uh, geographical areas from where we can isolate the microbes and can use them for the plant protection, which has not been done for. So far, we have been you know, focusing only the few microbes. So there's a huge potential. So we developed one white paper with the help of the CIA, and we submitted to the government of uh, Ministry of Petroleum, where we have had highlighted that if we are, if India has to become the uh, nirbhar in agrochemical market, it is only the through the bio biodiversity which we have, we can. There's a huge potential by which the India can take the lead in development of the micro-biopesticide through the botanicals and through the microbes. Next, please. Uh, so, uh, uh, there, in world over, there are 53 microbial biopesticides which are registered in, uh, we are talking about the 53, they are different formulation. They are, they are not the different microorganisms. They are only the variability is only in terms of the formulation, not in terms of the microorganisms. And then registration, as we have been talking about, is increasing because of the stringent regulations. It's not happening because of the, out of the choice, but its choice is because of the regulation. Next, please. Uh, disadvantage of the microbial biopsies, I need not to highlight that because Dr. Peter in the morning only highlighted and Dr. Lakshmi also highlighted that microbial has certain disadvantage in terms of the stability and formulation and so on. So I'll just skip this slide. Next, please. Uh, so uh, here I want to highlight that how the microbial metabolites could be of advantageous position as compared to the microbial ones. So uh, microbial secondary metabolites are known as a specialized metabolites, often have a unusual structures, uh, particularly the antibiotics and so on, and have demonstrated good eye bioactivity against the numerous targets. And then low, they, they have the low molecular mass and they have secondary metabolism and uh, which can take place in main microbial growth phase. Next, please. Uh, next. Uh, so these are the different classes of the compounds which are produced by these microbes. And they vary like uh, alkaloids to steroids, terpenoids, peptides, polyketones, flavonoids, quinols, phenols, and antibiotics. So it's a huge diversity of the micro metabolites which are produced by both by bacteria as well as the fungi. Please, please next please. Uh, so uh, there's a treasure of the, like there's a huge potential which can screen off for the new secondary metabolites. And there are 23,000 known secondary metabolites. Like initially the number which I give was the number for the microbes which we have existence. But we have 2300, uh, 23,000 known metabolites which are produced by these microbes and out of which 42% are produced by fungi, 42% by the actinomycetes and 16% by other bacterial species. So there's a huge, huge, huge potential which has yet to be tapped. Next please. Uh, advantage of the microbial metabolite is because, uh, as we have been talking since morning, that of the stability and so on, but uh, the metabolites are not so influenced by the bi abiotic or the biotic factors. That's the first and biggest advantage. The formulations, are, microbial metabolite formulations are more stable and work more efficaciously. And the risk of the pest and disease developing resistance often is considered to be low because we, most often we use them as a uh, crude extract, not as a pure compound, which we see in the case of the synthetic chemicals. In the case of synthetic chemicals, is, it is either a single molecule or two, mo most of the time it is a single molecule. And developing the resistance against the single molecules is very, very uh, early. So the resistance uh, development can take place within five years of the introduction of the chemical pesticide. Where in, in this case, when we are using the crude extract and having one biomarker, bioactive compound as a biomarker, the resistance development takes about, uh, it 
it's not that resistance doesn't develop. It develops but takes longer period of time, around 10 to 20 years. And then uh, residue of the biopesticide uh, which are there are non-hazardous, unlike the chemical pesticides, where we see that there's a hazardous residue and which causes problem uh, in terms of the export of the commodities many of the times. The, com the commodities have been rejected because of pesticide residue. And also it's not safe for the human consumption, even if we are talking about the domestic market. And the development and registration products cost cannot be spread over a wide range of pest control sales. Uh, so the, though the, these are treated as uh, at par with the biochemical uh, uh, pesticides, but uh, it is better than the uh, chemical pesticide. The, the, the registration is less stringent as compared to the chemical pesticide. Next, please. Next slide, please. Uh, so I just give you a few examples uh, which we have developed in, uh, which I particularly have developed, the microbial metabolite based biopesticide. This is the first, uh, first one. Next, previous one, please. Uh, so this is the first uh, 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 microbial metabolite which I isolated from Vidania somnifera, endophyte from the Vidania somnifera. Uh, this was one slide previous to this one. There was one slide just before that. One slide before that? No, okay, next one, please. Next one. Uh, so, uh, previous one, please. So, next one. Just hold on, yeah. So this is the antibiotic which, is, uh, which we isolated from with endophyte, isolated from Vidania somnifera. So this is the antibiotic is 210971, which had very good antifungal properties against sclerotonia. So this was isolated and purified uh, through uh, chromatographic techniques and uh, preparative HPLC. And what we found, uh, we found a direct correlation of the activity with, in, with the peak area. So we monitored each and every fraction by HPLC and we regressed the peak area of the each peak against the bioactivity of the fractions and we found a direct correlation with part one particular peak and based on that we targeted the purified that peak by help of the preparative HPLC and uh, we did the activity of the purified peak and then we found a very good activity. This is this was called the, uh, so this is, was the uh, first time this process was followed for purification or identification of the active compound. And this product, uh, this uh, antibiotic has been like formulated and has been given to one company. Please, please next please. And then another uh, project we did was uh, uh, Indo-Spanish project, uh, where we collaborated with the Spanish uh, institute called CSIC uh, the, to isolate the endophytes from four common medicinal plants and uh, do, do the bioactivity and prepare the extract of, from those uh, endophytes and do the acid. And then we did the bioassay mediated fractionation of the active compound. Next, please. Uh, so, uh, here we uh, isolated about 1500 fungal endophytes from those four medicinal plants and we did the assays against the four uh, fungal, uh, fungal pathogen. And one of the pathogen was, uh, out of that 50 was found to be having very good activity and then we prepared the extract from those 50 uh, endophytes and each extract was acid against the insect uh, spodoptera and the helicovarpa and also against the four fungal pathogen and also against the nematode. And based on that, we identified the four, four promising one from the Indian uh, endophytes, so Indian plant endophytes. And these were the endophyte one, two, three, and four, and five, and found to be activity targeted against the rhizoctonia, sclerotonia, and aphid activity, and then the botrytis and the fusarium and the spot proletaria. And then these were the five targeted one and then DBT supported this project to take these further and uh, uh, develop into a kind of product. Next please. So we did this uh, uh, purification and isolation of bioactive compounds from these, the metabolites of these five endophytes. Next please. And then we did the characterization using the NMR and uh, uh, COSI, NOISI, and uh, HMBC, KC, and the uh, high resolution mass spectrometry. Next, please. Next, please. Uh, so these are the five compounds we isolated, isolated from the endophyte one, which was found active against the 
uh, aphids, uh, uh, for uh, both the aphids, and this has been published in Microorganism. So this was the beta cysterone and the uh, olyl, what was the triglycerol, and then also the steroidal compounds. So these were the five uh, compounds isolated from the crude extract, and uh, out of that, the most active one was the linoleic stylaster. So this was the published in this one. And uh, next one, please. Next slide, please. Uh, so this one uh, has been, uh, we have filed the patent. This is a PCT application, which we has been filed for these five endophytes plus one AA22 uh, uh, endophyte, which we isolated from the Spanish plant for having the nematicidal activity. Next, please. Uh, so this is the uh, another uh, 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 what you call a metabolite-based product, which we developed from the BCMNCs. This is a neat, uh, bacillus uh, strain isolated from the tomato seed. So this is an endophyte we isolated from the tomato seed, and then we screened against the bioactivity against the uh, fusarium, and then we found it active against the tomato disease. We formulated it, the, the lipopeptide, which is produced by this uh, uh, microorganism, we formulated with the, the microorganism plus lipopeptide together, and then we found did the pot assays and we found this very good activity. Not, it's not only having the antifungal activity, but it also has the growth promoting activity. Yesterday we were discussing that uh, to include microbes as a biostimulant. And uh, Dr. Annapurna said that uh, microbes have multiple actions and this is a good example that it has both the uh, plant PGPR activity, it has the biostimulant property, it also has the antifungal property. So where to classify it? So this is the, uh, actually a very debatable issue. The classification of a microbe in the which category, I think it will depend on the major activity it, it contains, so that classification. So this is a good example where we found that it is not only having the antifungal uh, activity, but also have this growth promoting activities by producing certain, by eliciting the plant against uh, certain uh, biotic and abiotic factors. Next please. Uh, so this was the um, uh, isolation procedure. Next, please. And then this is a bioactivity of the lipopeptide, which we extracted from these bacillus siemensis. You can see there's a direct correlation of the bioactivity, like uh, at 1,000 ppm and up to 250 micro ppm, we are getting very good activity. And the IC50 value was 230.5, so which is quite good. And this was formulated based on that one. Next, please. This is patented one. And then uh, the same microbe was also like looked for the production of the VOCs, volatile compound, because uh, microbes also produce the volatile compounds. So we assess all the 70 microbes which we isolated from this uh, uh, tomato seed against the, it's uh, having the VOC, uh, active VOCs uh, by the dual plate culture. So we just inverted the pathogen and the, uh, this uh, endophyte together. And we, if it is inhibiting, uh, so by the, uh, just by the gaseous exchange, uh, if it is able to inhibit the growth of the pathogen or not. Next, please. And then we also injected these VOCs into GCMS. So we did this, we cult, uh, like, uh, cultured the, this, uh, the active ones into a broth. And then the supernatant from the broth was injected directly through the uh, uh, in GCMS through the SPME extraction. And the SPME uh, needle was injected into GCMS to see which are the volatile compounds which are produced in this, uh, in this uh, microorganism, which are able to inhibit the uh, growth of the rhizoctonia. Next, please. And uh, by the GCMS, which we, we could uh, identify the four active molecules. One was 2-methyl-2-heptone, the fentanyl, uh, undecanone and hepatitecane, which was found to be very active against this, uh, uh, this uh, uh, fun, uh, against this fungi, which has infects the tomato. So this particular application is the for the post-harvest disease management. You can develop the patch, which we can keep in the, during the packaging of the fruits, and this patch can have the slow release, can slowly release the volatile compound, and which can help in the post-harvest disease management. You know this in India, about 20 to 80% of the our 
produce is uh, particularly the uh, vegetables and the fruits are lost is because of the post harvest diseases so this could be another area of uh, pest management so far we have been focusing only on the uh, field applications but this is a uh, additional advantage by having the pocs production of the vocs we can also uh, control the disease post harvest diseases but not by touching the by applying any uh, fungicide or any uh, bactericide on the fruits and vegetables next please so these are the four uh, this chemical structure of the compounds uh, which we isolated next please uh, so coming to the future prospects of this uh, microbial metabolites so endophytes and microbial metabolites hold a lot of promises and there is still a lot of uh, uh, what you call uh, opportunities away which is yet to be availed to protect the plants from abiotic stresses as well as from the biotic stresses and uh, various technologies have been developed based on the endophytes and the application in the agriculture crops but it's uh, uh, and there is need to all accelerate the pace of the development of them in the mission mode. So far, we it's a, it's a happening at a very low level. So there's a need that uh, uh, for where it's not only uh, we need to not only have to develop this technology in at a fast pace, but we also need to develop the capacities to do the R and D in this area because the capacity uh, the capacity of utilizing the microbial metabolites is not that high. So we need particular Particularly, the isolation and characterization of the molecules. This need to be developed and uh, at a last fast pace so that it can be exploited for the f as a future biopesticide. Next, please. So this is a study done by the ADB, where they uh, they studied various technologies uh, which have the uh, like potential to uh, prove better for the. Uh, uh, as a climate resilient technologies and they have uh, pr predicted that uh, endophytes uh, uh, are the future uh, technologies, endophyte based technology is a future technology which will help the farmers in combating with the climate change. So this is, uh, and they, they did studied various technology across the world, not only in India, but across the world. And this came out to be uh, a very uh, good technology, nandophyte based technology, which uh, they, they predicted is going to dominate the uh, agriculture world later on and will going to be the future uh, technology to help the farmers in combating with the climate change. Next, please. Uh, with the these words, I would like to end here, and I would like to like acknowledge the support which I have received from various funding agencies. And uh, uh, next, please. And uh, all my collaborators, I learned the this microbial metabolite based uh, studies from Professor Peter Proch in Germany. Uh, the, because earlier I used to work only on botanical biopesticide, but microbial interest only I got when I came in contact with Professor Peter Proch, and he taught me how to do this microbial metabolite based studies and endophytes and so on. And all my collaborators are here, so thank you, Sarima, very much. And I hope that. Uh, uh, some interest will grow uh, from in this group uh, based on this uh, uh, my presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you, Bipa, for inviting me for this uh, Agri uh, by Agri 2022, and uh, we are one year old. In fact, last year also we were discussing on the same topic, and uh, thank. Thank you all participants in advance to listening to some of the regulations and other things which may not be as very pleasing as probably the science talks. In fact, I, have, I, have, I just wanted to remind those people who were there last year that uh, I ended my talk telling that regular science is different from regulatory science. Probably that has a lot of significance here because yesterday also we were listening. Regular science allows emotions, regular science allows farmer benefit, lot of things, but once it is a regulatory science, probably we should be, or probably will be preferred to be there in those committees, as much emotionless as possible. Uh, second thing is that while going for the regulations also, as he rightly pointed out, as it is being yesterday also being told, uh, definitely we will be looking for those type of harmonizations, those type of flexibilities, as he rightly told, 
am first an entomologist, bike control specialist, then uh, roped into the regulatory mechanism. So with this few words, uh, I just wanted to, I will not take, uh, I will take help of this presentation. I will not explain uh, whatever there in the slides. Uh, first thing is that as yesterday also it is being discussed. In fact, I was noting down yesterday also that whatever the points that are risen by some of the speakers, some of the people who were discussing, that those points also I wanted to cover. The one of the point reason yesterday is that, that how a microorganism or a biopesticide, when it is called as biopesticide, when it is called as biofertilizer, when it is called as something else, maybe by stimulant and other thing, situation is very clear. Yesterday also we discussed uh, whatever you call, then accordingly we will see into it. That is one aspect which I wanted to talk about. Second thing is that I will not go into the detail. In fact, this is the slide which I have shown last year also. Just to tell that, just to put in a simplest way possible, this is the registration procedure. If anybody is interested, because within 15 minutes of time, we cannot go for that uh, total procedure. Many of you are well aware of that, well into it. So these are the registration procedures, wherein probably some of the flexibilities what we talk about uh, with regard to the registration number, with regard to the manufacturing license, with regard to the getting the sale permission and other thing. Those issues, whenever it comes, I will discuss with regard to that one. And this is also the one which I wanted to show you. The reason because yesterday, I think if I am right, Vimla Madam of IPL, uh, this one, she was talking about some of the things like that they want to have their own protocols of quality testing. Uh, maybe uh, there are strains and other things will be totally of uh, maybe having some incubation, not falling within the ranges of the already available methods of the quality control and other thing. Uh, that is a thing which you are looking at positively, but that may complicate the regulatory mechanism also. Because we need to see that we are the people here, we need to see, we go for the minimum standards Maximum is your sky is the limit. Reach up to 100, no problem. But the thing is that minimum we have to see. So that is one thing. Uh, we, and accordingly, for viruses, for bacteria, for antagonistic fungi and entomopathogenic fungi, the, the guidelines are already prepared. If you go to the CABRC website, you will see that whatever the quality standards, they are specific as per the groups that have been mentioned. Then if you go on adding these groups, I don't know, I may be corrected if I am wrong. Are we simplifying or are we complicating? Also, you kindly try to see the other side of the story also. These are the, as an example, for all of them it is there. Bacterial it is there, fungal it is there, uh, microbial, all other organisms it is there. As an example, as uh, one uh, speaker was also telling, once it is a liquid formulation and once it comes to the talc based formulation, 8% moisture content is the limit. So, those type of variations, by taking the very purpose why we are here, the very purpose where we can be useful to you people is that, you come up with your experiences, you come up with your constraints, then probably these ranges can be discussed. It is a dynamic procedure. Every time we are telling regulatory mechanism is a dynamic procedure, we will be adding after discussing it in RC meetings, after putting it to the RC meetings, the things can be modified as per our need. Because nothing is going to be static. That is one message just I wanted to give. Then technical auditing also. Once we go for the, that is why I have shown that first slide. Once we go for that manufacturing license and other thing, we are having a very clear guidelines that are given. You may, all might be knowing. In fact, many of the BIPA members, I know BIPA since 2003. I think almost uh, two decades we know BIPA. Now only many of you people might be knowing. All the BIPA uh, founder members, they were all the people we were together since our uh, uh, two decades back also. At that time also, once we go for the issue of the manufacturing license as a committee to visit, to see whether that particular production facility is having the required minimum facilities in terms of infrastructure, in terms of space required, in terms of the human expertise required, then there were no guidelines. That was one of the lacuna. Now, as per this categorization again, the guidelines were given. What, uh, what should be minimum? What is the minimum space required? What is the minimum mass production uh, equipment that is required? What is the minimum domestic quality checkup material that need to be there in place? All these things are required. So, I'm not telling that whatever experiences you have, which are coming out of the ranges of what already has been fixed by the CIBRC or government of India, you're welcome but you are welcome in a proper way. 
through proper channel that these are the inputs from the industry, these are the th places where probably we need to reconsider, then everything will go smooth. So, but on the basis of that, if we don't want regulation, probably things will not materialize. So that is one thing again, I just want to, I'm just flagging the issues. In fact, with, in 15 minutes, I can't talk about all the regulations with regard to the vast range of the biopesticides, but probably I'm flagging the issue by taking advantage of this 15 minutes. I am here till evening. Whenever, whatever type of queries you want to make, I am uh, open for it and we will be noting down. In fact, it is not something like that. We will be speaking and go going. In fact, this is the one in regulatory mechanism, you are helping us. Whatever the feedback which I will be getting it here, the seriously we will be noting it down. We will be putting it to our committees and other thing. Now, this is what? In fact, yesterday night only I prepared after listening to IPL person, after listening to some of the other speakers also. These are all good things, high potency than others, right? I agree. Wider ranges than the normal allowed biological attributes, inequality of the testing protocols, special formulation technologies, like he was talking about, I think a drones person, probably he will be coming and delivering. All the things is going to be again modified if, it, if the same microbial biopesticide is going to be applied through drones. Even for chemical pesticides also, see sometimes I want to support the regulation it is versus public demand. Sometimes the regulations has to be funny. Uh, sorry for using that word. Once the drones came into the picture, it has been promoted like anything by the highest people. Then once it comes to the regulation part, nobody will help. Nobody will help. Once it came to the application level claim expansion, applied it through drones, we don't have anything and we want to develop. And once we develop, till that time, the promoters are not stopping. You might have seen that order. All the chemical pesticides which are having given or which are approved for label claim for the normal types of or conventional types of spraying are allowed for two years till we develop guidelines. You read it positively, you are, we are promoting drone technology. You read it scientifically, that means we are allowing something without knowing. Tomorrow if I come up with a guideline that this is totally wrong, we should not do it. Those two years are not going to come back. Try to understand that type of compulsions also. Promotion of the technology, keeping the regulations in place. Sometimes it is a very tight rope walk. Kindly help us in that regard. So these are all the good ones, highest self life and other thing. Probably if your product is unique and other thing, then you are worth enough to go for separate this thing. But for uh, the other things, if you do that, probably we don't call it as a simplification which we are here for, as a regulatory members, we will be more complicating. That is only my apprehension. I may be corrected if I am wrong. Then, it is always inclusive. What I mean to tell you is that exclusive regulatory mechanism, government of India cannot afford to have. It should serve a wide range of the people with least amendments possible whenever it is necessary, whenever it is totally needed, then only we should go for it. Exclusive type of mandatory requirements is this thing. And this also, many of you are, might be knowing, I am just cautioning, social service, emotions and other things will not work, irrespective of their origin, either it is a government uh, developmental uh, lab, or it is a private entrepreneur, typically like you people, or even if it is an NGO, who will be talking about, in fact, whenever Sudha Reddy Madam talks about, I used to note it down that she should not go more emotional. The reason because giving many inputs to the farmer is a service, good service. But good service can be called as good service only when it is as per the procedures and as per the legal requirements. So that also we need to definitely take into consideration. As you know, own usage, research purposes, other than agriculture usages, then only we are out of the act. The last bullet also, if it is other than agriculture usage, we write very cautiously that as in whatever the rules are, whatever the acts are applicable there, they will apply. We are only not going to regulate. The next question came yesterday. This is also an added slide. Testing labs. Yes, I agree. There is lack of testing labs improving. So only thing from government side, what I can talk, at, talk about it is that the situation is much better than the earlier years. 
and we are trying to strengthen it. N enable accreditation is in the process, many of the things, and we are pressurizing many of the labs who are going for the testing and other things. They should have this type of standard protocols. Then, level claim issues, I will not go into the detail. These are the main things wherein we always see that as per the label claim only, we are going to approve. I just put some of the slides. I think this is your product only I added. Just to see that these are the mandatory requirements. Whatever the other things, I will not go into the detail. Yesterday somebody was telling uh, during the evening with regard to the regulatory mechanism uh, of biostimulants that we don't have state agriculture university support to test a huge number of those things. So maybe already available data can also be utilized. These are some of the things which I will leave the presentation so that you can go through the issues of label claim, uh, uh, this one. And last one, as uh, Dr. John Peter was telling, he was talking about 145th, uh, two, 425th meeting of RC meeting. After that, for uh, 27th meeting, a committee has been formed under the chairmanship of uh, ADG Plant Protection. Uh, as he is telling, I am also a member in that. That committee is not only for the bio pesticide consortium that is also for the existing biopesticide guidelines revamping. Many of the issues which we have risen yesterday are already being addressed. Only thing is that procedurally we have to come after one uh, what you call 240, uh, uh, 247th meeting then again uh, that has been referred to all the three national bureaus. National Bureau for uh, Agriculture Insect Resources, National Bureau for Agricultural Impact and Microbes, National Bureau for Biotic Stress Management, and also IRI. Then in the next meeting, in the last meeting, they have given a public notice also. Many of you are aware that 15th of February 2022, the public notice has been given that anybody is having any clarifications, additions, suggestions can be given. They are welcome. That is the status. Probably after that thing, probably that will be coming into the picture. So yesterday, nano biopesticides, biosafety issues is one concern. These are some of the new challenges. Nano, uh, RCGM, GSC, because yesterday Dr. Appara was telling that there may be some genetic changes. Gene silencing will be there. Then we need to see that. Then permission to develop their own QC protocol as Madam was telling yesterday. Then Biodiversity Act. This is one of the very, very big concerns for us also. The regulatory mechanism. So biodiversity is one issue. I will close my talk by telling that this is the one. We need to, if somebody feels that regulatory mechanism is a break, you are the people, wise people to decide. You want to drive faster with a vehicle which is having brakes or without having brakes. You are the people to decide. In fact, this I have copied down from the last year when uh, Mr. Ram Kaundanya was there. He was telling that regulation is very important. It is as good as driving a vehicle as fast as possible because I know the brakes are there. Imagine the other situation, I fully know brakes are not there. How fast I can go. Thanks, uh, Ram Kaundanya, he is not here. So with this, thank you very much once again for giving me this opportunity. Any clarifications, I am here available till evening. Uh, you are most welcome. Thank you. Uh, I think uh, uh, due to paucity of time, uh, we have to not to have some questions now. Maybe during the tea break and other things, uh, with the permission of the uh, our speakers, panel of speakers here, maybe you can interact directly with whomever you would like to ask any questions. Please, you can share. Uh, thank you very much, uh, speakers, for uh, excellent presentations. Uh, there's so many aspects which have come out now for the future. And one important thing is we all must know that the future is very good for the biopesticides and we have to replace some of the chemical pesticides. It is naturally happening, but we should be ready and prepared. For this, we need to see future as a very challenging aspect. I mean, everybody has put that, I mean, especially Dr. John Peter has given where the uh, challenges are there. I mean, how to improve the formulations and stability of the products and how effective they should be like equivalent to chemical uh, pesticides. Like, I mean, when we are working with the metabolites, you don't need the uh, uh, microenvironment uh, situations so that we can be guaranteed results can be seen. 
or neither I mean say yesterday's talk uh, the local isolates work better for the bio fertilizer kind of uh, issues if you are working with a different kind of a formulation or a delivery systems we don't probably need that kind of a thing these are the things we need to be making for future more and coming to pheromones as I have uh, told uh, pheromones especially biopesticides and pheromones the regulation has to be going uh, our research and the regulation should go on hand in hand like if pheromone there is any concession given we'll have answers for more than 200 uh, pests without chemicals we can control similarly for biopesticides there are many things which can be uh, taken on a fast track and other things i hope the industry lives up to the expectation of a useful brakes in the car and have the speed also but not that brake alone is going to be the thing we need to have a uh, acceleration also which is important for going fast if you have only one brake and we, we we don't have acceleration the speed can never be attained i think this this is the take home points what i have um, maybe we can discuss on the break tea break and lunch breaks and other things thank you very much Thank you, panel. Thanks, uh, Lakshmi and the team. You are requested to please be seated and come back. Uh, I mean, okay, now since you walk, uh, Ajay, group photo clear for the session speakers group photo. This is a very interesting group here. We have three BIPA executive committee members, two advisors, and you know, uh, uh, and uh, the two sponsors. I think that makes a big team out here. So why don't uh, President uh, join uh, to please honor the uh, speakers here, please? Yeah. So. Me can do this or Walla Kistun or Miro. We start with Dr. John Peter. Oh, as you wish. <laughs> Dr. John Peter, Vice President, BIPA, and uh, Chairman, Varsha Biosenses. Dr. Sudhareddy. <laughs> Managing Director, Kane Biosenses, Joint Secretary, BIPA. You need to move around, no? Achha, okay, petrende. Lakshmi, Lakshmi Narayana, Vice President Bipa and... Uh, and then we have Dr. S.J. Rahman, Advisor Bipa and Professor PJTSU. I'm sure Dr. Nutan Kaushik would love this. The only picture we got it. Dr. Nutan Kaushik, Director General Amiti. And uh, we especially thank Dr. Nutan Kaushik. Last year, BioAct 2021 was inaugurated by the session, Dr. Ratan Lal's speech. Thank you, Madam, for that. And then, yeah. I, before even announced, you went. Is Prashant Kare <laughs> absolute? <laughs> then Dr. Mark, ATGC. Incidentally, that's the only picture that came. Otherwise, all farmers ka aur apke ana tha ho. And I saw your post also recently. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, luck for all of us to you. Thank you so much.